Good afternoon, Northeast Campus. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon for this very significant event as part of our celebrations for Black History Month. My sincere thanks to the Dean, to the Chair, and to all the faculty of the History Department for collaborating on this event and bringing us here together for this very critical conversation. June 9th, 2020 is a day that I will remember forever. It was the day that the city of Houston bid farewell to one of her sons, Mr. George Floyd. Mr. Floyd was a close friend and childhood companion of one of my close friends, and therefore that loss was very personal. In the months since then, We've had many conversations in our families, in our communities, and as a nation that have centered around the discourse of equity, empathy, and healing. Our speaker today is the perfect person to help us to continue and further those discussions. The work that he does with the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission to heal our communities and to foster reconciliation is the need of the hour in our quest for equity and empathy. It's quite an honor to introduce him. Mr. Phil Armstrong is a native of Ohio and has lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma for more than 20 years. He brings a varied background both in the corporate sector and as an entrepreneur in the restaurant business He's also been a very active community partner in the Tulsa community, having served on several nonprofit boards, including the Bartholm School for Music, the Community Service Council, the Reading Partners of Tulsa, and as chairperson of the Greenwood Cultural Center. Mr. Armstrong holds bachelor's degrees in mass communications from the Central State University and a master's in public administration from the University of Akron, both in Ohio. With the commission, its subcommittees, and with key organizations in the Greenwood District to execute plans for the upcoming 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which happened in 1921. As I was reading about Mr. Armstrong and the work of the commission, one phrase in their mission really stood out to me, and that phrase was to quote, to harness our connective tissue. That phrase really appealed to me because as we work toward equity and empathy, we need to harness our connective tissue to bring not only our campus community, but also the larger Tarrant County community together to move forward in excellence. Mr. Armstrong, we so appreciate your participation this afternoon, and we're very excited to learn more about your work with the Commission, and also to learn how we can move forward on that journey toward healing and reconciliation. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to present to you, Mr. Phil Armstrong. Thank you everyone for allowing me to be uh, with you this afternoon and uh, for the invite from Chloe. I greatly appreciate this. Any opportunity that we have to share the history, uh, this immense history of the Greenwood community and of Tulsa, um, I do my best to take advantage of that. Um, what we're going to do today is really have a, a, a conversation, uh, more so a presentation of the history, but at the end we will have opportunity to have a Q&A. I really look forward to the questions and the discussions that we can have around this history and around everything that I'm uh, going to present. Um, the work of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, this commission is the second state appointed commission uh, around this history. The first commission, uh, again, bipartisan state appointed commission, uh, served in 1997 to 2001, and that commission was uh, put together to specifically study the um, devastation and the impact of the 1921 Tulsa race riot. 
um, at the end of that exhaustive study, and it was extremely well done, um, they offered solutions. Um, they offered the actual evidence and uh, accuracy in the number of deaths and the actual evidence of the amount of damages and financial destruction and insurance claims that were never paid out to the um, businesses and those who lived in Greenwood at the time and offered reparation recommendations um, to make these people whole. Um, here we are 20 years later and those recommendations unfortunately still have not been uh, accepted or embraced by um, the overall political climate in Oklahoma. Um, but this commission was formed in 2015 to look specifically at how we as a city, as a state and a nation can commemorate, can memorialize and commemorate that 100 years is about to pass. And what do we as the citizens of this city and of the state uh, have to show for what's different? Um, what do we have to say after 100 years has passed since this tragedy? And so the commission again has been working with the community, various community meetings, various community partners that are members of the commission, and we now are on uh, a fast trajectory to implement a number of items that you will see and hear about in my presentation. So I just want to give you a little background of where we are and how we got to 2021 and the years that it's taken us to develop the um, um, the reputation of uh, convening all groups together, uh, white, black, young, old, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, to sit at the table uh, of reconciliation, of acknowledgement, education, and reconciliation. So I'm sharing my screen. I'm going to start through this presentation. Um, if, uh, on your screen, you should see now uh, Greenwood Rising, the legacy of Black Wall Street. And in fact, I need to do one more thing. I've got to share my computer sound and I need to go back and do that. So give me just a moment to uh, redo that again. OK, now we should be ready. So I'm going to start this out. The very next thing you will see is a video. And that video is three minutes and 38 seconds of uh, the opening of the show produced by HBO called HBO Watchmen. Um, after the video, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that in detail um, and talk about the video itself and uh, the impact of what HBO was able to present to the world. But I want you to try to take yourself back to Sunday night. August the 20th, 2019. And if you were, or maybe you're not, but if you were an avid fan of DC and Marvel Comics and how many of these comic book stories are coming to life on the screen, and you were awaiting and anticipating what would be the visual interpretation by HBO of what Watchmen would be, and you had an HBO subscription uh, all over the country, all over the world, the debut of Watchmen, Imagine your surprise and shock that the first episode and the first few seconds, the few minutes of that episode would reveal this event in Tulsa of 1921. So I'm going to show that now. And again, the first three minutes and 38 seconds of Watchmen, and we're going to talk about that.
Let's stop right there uh, for uh, a brief moment and talk about what we uh, pretty much just observed there. Um, so in the weeks and the days immediately uh, after what took place, and I believe I'm getting a pop up warning here that there's people waiting to get into the, the meeting, whoever is handling the controls for that. Um, and looks like I'm having some, there we go. So in the immediate days after the debut of that, myself and along with um, many members of the commission for the next two weeks, we took several, several calls and back-to-back -back interviews from news agencies all over the country, literally from CNN to MSNBC, to Fox News, to um, the major news medias, the Washington Journal, uh, the New York Times, even Fortune Magazine, uh, National Geographic, the BBC, the list went on and on. And they would call to talk about what was shown by HBO. And they would all say the exact same thing. Number one, they'd say, can you please define to us how much of what we saw was Hollywood hype and how much was actually true? I mean, you know, planes flying over and dropping bombs and shooting, you know, uh, you know, we understand there's a lot of Hollywood hype with things. So please explain to us what was accurate and what was not. So then I would spend the next um, 15 to 20 minutes to explain that pretty much everything that they saw are eyewitness accounts by black citizens and white citizens from 1921. Those eyewitness accounts are held currently at the Oklahoma Historical Society that talked about everything that they saw during the event, which included planes flying over, 
and dropping incendiary devices uh, referred to as kerosene bombs on the rooftops of the homes of the businesses. Um, reports of guns being strafed through the community from these planes flying over. And it was probably the way I best explain was it probably was the best and the most realistic visual representation of what happened that day, May 31st to June the 2nd, 1921. So after we explain that and get that out of the way, then they all ask the same follow up question. If all of that happened and it happened like that, how come nobody knows about it? And therein lies the crux of the situation. Why we're here today, the Centennial Commission to enlighten, to educate, to explain what happened, to let communities and people know that this systematically was covered up for many years. In the black community, it was not discussed anymore because of the fear that it could happen again, the retribution that could come as a result of that. Um, the post-traumatic stress disorder that many of them probably went through because of the trauma. And for those that remained, they just wasn't discussed. Among white citizens, it was embarrassment, it was shame, it was shock of what they could do uh, when passions and, and a mob mentality has the reign and what it did to what they were trying to promote as Tulsa it was being dubbed as the magic city because of the oil and gas industry and what it was doing to the city of Tulsa. And they did not want this discussed. And so we have to this day, um, people in their 20s, in their 30s, in their early 40s that will email me and come up to me and say, do you know the first time I even saw any images of this or heard about this, I was in college outside of the state of Oklahoma and again, these are white individuals and black individuals that will say to me to this day, I'm sitting in a college course and taking a history class and the professor starts showing these images of what took place here. And I'm sitting there and they say, I, I'm shocked. Then they say, I'm embarrassed because the other members of the class are looking at me and saying, hey, you're from Oklahoma. Tell us more about this. And they have to sit there and say, I have no idea what this is. And then they say, I get angry. Why am I a grown adult in a college class hearing about this for the very first time? And so I like to talk about that video because it was very controversial. There were those who pushed back against it and thought it was uh, shouldn't have been shown, um, thought, criticized it for being Hollywood hype, not knowing that what they saw was an accurate depiction of what took place there uh, on the screen. So now that we've got kind of our stage set, let's uh, talk a little bit more uh, about uh, some of the other things in that video and then we'll get into the meat of, uh, of the presentation. I'm going to take a moment here to uh, share my screen again and and we will move forward. So one of the things that was uh, a, a homage or paying honor and tribute in the video was the young woman playing the piano and the young young boy watching the movie screen. That was in the Lula Williams Dreamland Theater. The Dreamland Theater was a state of the art theater in historic Greenwood, and it was a feature not only for Greenwood citizens, but all of Tulsa. Black citizens and white citizens would come into Greenwood to watch the musical productions and the plays that were going here. It boasted of having the only theater in the state with air conditioning, whatever air conditioning would have been back in 1921. They talked about it and they boasted it, but it was a state of the art. It was an icon of the community. And of course it was destroyed um, in 1921, never to re be rebuilt. Also, the black and white silent film was a homage to an in, uh, and paying tribute to Bass Reeves, the real life of Bass Reeves, the first black deputy U.S. Marshal that served the territories of Oklahoma and Arkansas. He uh, was one of the most prolific U.S. deputy marshals that ever lived. He brought over 3000 felons to justice. He only killed about 14 people in self-defense and bringing them to justice. He was known for being very crafty and uh, skillful in bringing, he would disguise himself. He also could speak fluent uh, Muscogee Creek 
and uh, Cherokee and Sal uh, um, uh, Chickasha, Chickasha. Uh, so he could speak Native American tongue and languages, and that's what also made him very successful. But I talk about this because he is uh, that real life person of Bass Reeves is the inspiration to the character of the Lone Ranger, hence the black mask that covers his face. Bass Reeves is the subject of the season two, episode four of Gunslingers, the real Lone Ranger. And if you travel to Arkansas, you will find that they have a larger than life statue there of Bass Reeves and talks about his history. Um, and he is the forerunner or the inspiration for the character of the Lone Ranger. And I'm sure some of you, as I say, you got a wrinkle in your brain, you just learned something new. Uh, I don't know how many of you got up on Sunday, Saturday mornings watching the Lone Ranger and not knowing that that character was based on the real life of a black U.S. Deputy Marshal. Tulsa's historic Greenwood District reflects the power of the human spirit generally, the vision, determination, and resilience of its oppressed and marginalized black citizens specifically. That word resilience is a, what, what I want you to focus on. Everything that we are going to talk about has this overarching theme of the human spirit, the indomitable human spirit, and that spirit of resilience. That spirit can be seen in the book written by local author, uh, uh, author Hannibal B. Johnson. He's from Arkansas, but has lived here for the last 30 years. He is the foremost expert and authority of all history regarding Greenwood and the history of the, the massacre. And he uh, shows a letter, an actual letter correspondence that took place between Oliver and Curtis the days after the massacre. I'm going to read it aloud and you can read along with me. Dear Oliver, I am, by our local newspaper, fully advised of the whole terrible tragedy there. Now that they have destroyed your homes and wrecked your schools, churches, and business places and killed your people, I am sure that the Negroes will rapidly give up the town and move. Move north. Enclosed, please find draft for $40 to purchase your ticket to Detroit. We'll be expecting you. Curtis. And his response? Dear Curtis, how kind of you to volunteer your sympathetic assistance. It is just like you to be helpful to others in time of stress like this. True it is, we are facing a terrible situation. It is equally true that they have destroyed our homes. They have wrecked our schools. They have reduced our churches to ashes and they have murdered our people, Curtis, but they have not touched our spirit. And while I speak only for myself, let it be said that I came here and built my fortune with that spirit. I shall reconstruct it here with that spirit. And I expect to live on and die here with it, Oliver. And it is with that spirit and that mindset that you see in that correspondence that we build Greenwood Rising, the Black Wall Street History Center, currently under construction and set to debut during the week of the centennial in May of 2021. It's being built at the corner of Greenwood and Archer. That was the historic gateway or the opening when you entered into the business district of Greenwood. Um, it is an 11,000 square feet facility, a narrative museum experience. We're not a collections artifacts museum, but a narrative historical experience to really engage the visitor through the story and the arc of the history of this community. Um, we are in, um, uh, planning with the uh, museum design expert studio called Local Projects. They're based out of New York City. They designed the 9-11 Museum in New York City. They also did significant work with Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative for the building of the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, but we have been just blessed really to work with such an, a, an incredible group. So let's go through the museum a little bit, a couple of highlights. First thing you'll do is you'll step into the Greenwood spirit. You'll learn about the different communities and learn how Greenwood came to be and see and experience that when you step inside of Greenwood Rising. You'll learn about the historic black towns of Oklahoma. Here you'll see from the Oklahoma Historical Society, 
established by uh, at least by 1880. Many of these towns, all black towns, and when I say all black, what I'm saying is the businesses, the homes, the property, the grocery stores, the banks, the haberdasheries, everything inside of these towns were black owned and operated, all black towns of Oklahoma. As you can see, they were all over the place. By the 1940s, there were over 50 historic all black towns of Oklahoma. So before you get to a Greenwood, you have to tell the story that, hey, there were prospering towns all in Oklahoma 20, 30, 40 years before Greenwood was established. So we talk about that history. We also talk about the size, the sheer size of Greenwood and its residents. There were 10 to 12,000 African-Americans living in Greenwood at that time. If you'll follow my cursor, uh, this is the corner, the area, Greenwood and Archer, where we're going to build the museum. If you've ever been down here for a drillers baseball game, you'll see this historic buildings of Greenwood and what seems to be left. But you don't have a full perspective of just how massive and wide this area was. 10 to 12,000 African Americans lived in this area, 33 to 35 city blocks. I'll let that marinate on your mind for a moment. 33 the 35 city blocks was what was Greenwood, of homes, of businesses, and all a very vibrant, entrepreneurial, active community. So we talk about some of those pioneers. There in your screen is E.W. Woods, Ellis Walker Woods. There is currently an Ellis Walker Woods Booker T. Washington Memorial that's just north of where I sit right now. It tells of his history, how he was the first principal of the famed Booker T. Washington High School, the colored school that educated all the African-Americans in this area. He walked over 600 miles from Memphis, Tennessee to accept the appointment as the first principal. And we will showcase so many other pioneers. Um, we have here uh, just a, a, an indication of our, of our influence or our impact to have a robust educational program. We will have opportunities to bring children in from schools and field trips from all over the state to learn this wonderful history. Talk about and learn the Trail of Tears and the Freedmen and the association of the five civilized tribes and how African Americans even ended up in Oklahoma in the first place. Black boosterism and these all black towns and their vibrancy and the pioneers of Greenwood. Um, one of the next exhibits that we're excited to showcase, if you know anything about black communities, um, you know that the uh, historically uh, the black church and the black barbershop or the black salon was where and to this day where black citizens still congregate and laugh and talk and fellowship and get their politics. And so we will have a hologram black barbershop experience to tell the history of a community. Imagine stepping into this exhibit and being into transported back into the 1900s of a barbershop and having these hologram experience, laughing and talking with the banter that you find in a black barbershop, talking about Greenwood and the history of Greenwood. It'll be even to the extent that if you sit in the barber chair, um, the hologram may turn and act as if they are cutting your hair and talk to you. In this example, if a young student sits in the barber chair, the, the hologram may say something like, never forget where you come from and who you are. Uh, we are really excited because there will be no other experience, no other museum or history center in the world that will showcase a black barbershop experience to tell a history. So people from all over the world have to come to Greenwood Rising to experience that right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'll have a timeline to talk about the arc of oppression, that the 1921 incident was not something that just happened unto itself. There was a building up of anxiety, racial tensions, and there was a leading up to where 1921 was, a, a, the racial tensions were as such that a powder keg of emotions and, and anxiety was here, and all it needed was a striking of the match for something to ignite. And that striking of the match is the elevator incident that took place inside the Drexler building you see pictured there, um, where a 19-year-old black boy named Dick Rowland and a 17-year-old white girl named Sarah Page, who was the elevator operator, he was a shoe shine boy and the only place in Tulsa that uh, downtown that had restroom facilities called colored restrooms 
was on the third floor of the Drexler building. He went to relieve himself. He gets back on the elevator. Something happens. The elevator shifts. He loses his step. He goes to fall and grabs Sarah Page's arm to steady himself, and she screams. When the elevator rests on the bottom floor, the doors open up and he runs away. What happens then is the merchant from across the street who heard the screams came to her aid. By that evening in the Tulsa Tribune paper on the front page, this scathing article, Nab Negro for attacking girl in an elevator. I'm gonna highlight one of the paragraphs here that they write. Um, a few minutes later, he entered the elevator, she claimed, and attacked her, scream, scratching her hands and face and tearing her clothes. Her screams brought a clerk from Renberg's store to her assistance, and the Negro fled. Look at the bottom paragraph here. Tenants of the Drexel building said the girl is an orphan who works as an, who works as an elevator operator to pay her way through business college. I highlight those two because if you any of you are journalism majors or have studied communications and journalism, you know that there was something in the early 1900s that was practiced called yellow journalism. Yellow journalism was the way that, unfortunately, newspapers tried to sell newspapers in the early days. They would compete with each other. Who could tell the most salacious story? Who could add a little color, a little flavor, and have it be more entertaining? Um, Tulsa Tribune engaged in yellow journalism because those paragraphs that talk about him scratching her face and trying to tear away her clothes, those incidents did not happen. In fact, when they tried to approach Sarah Page to press charges to Dick Rowland after the massacre, she would not agree because the things that were written in the article that led to the event happening in the first place, um, she would not attest to them because they were false. Uh, at the bottom of the article where it says she was an orphan trying to pay her way through uh, business school. She was not an orphan. She lived with her parents. She was not going to business school, but the damage was done. Imagine if you were a white citizen and you uh, believe a certain way of the Ku Klux Klan, that one community, one uh, aspect of, of a citizens are beneath you um, ethnically, and you have this building of racial animosity, the jealousy of all this wealth that's happening right across the railroad tracks. And you open up the paper and you see basically the dog whistle that this newspaper article said is a black boy tried to rape, rape an innocent white girl on an elevator downtown Tulsa in broad daylight. What are we going to do about it? And so this article really led to a mob forming after Dick Rowland was arrested, a mob forged around a mob of about a thousand white citizens uh, to try to lynch, bring him out of the courthouse and lynch Dick Rowland. Black residents of Greenwood hear about this, about three dozen African-American males who served in World War I in 1919 came back home, disciplined with their guns, unafraid with their own munitions, marched down to the courthouse, surrounded the courthouse to protect Dick Rowland so he can have his due justice in court um, and to keep him from being lynched. And as it says in this article, as you can see, a white man by the name of Mr. McQueen confronted one of the black men. His last name was Cole. McQueen tried to take the gun from him. They wrestled over the gun. The gun discharges, it fires. And at that moment, as more than one person observed, quote, all hell broke loose. The first shots fired at 1030, May 31st, 1921. And over the course of 18 hours, Greenwood was destroyed. After the first shots were fired, the black citizens retreated to Greenwood. Um, the mob increased to about 1,500. The Tulsa Police Department deputized, yes, I said deputized, and all of this, again, is held within the Oklahoma Historical Society, um, the notes, the minutes, the newspaper articles. Many of them were deputized, given guns, given ammo, and by 1.30 in the morning, they marched into Greenwood at the corner of Archer and Elgin and began to loot began to murder, began to burn 
and destroy Greenwood, and as you can see, destroyed it to the ground. Days after that, black citizens who remained and did not um, suffer uh, a loss of life um, began to decide what they were going to do, and they decided that they were going to rebuild. And so money was collected among these black towns and from around the country that heard what had happened and money flowed in. Uh, mind you, because it was called a riot and because the Tulsa Tribune, the mayor of Tulsa at that time and the uh, powers that were in control wanted to lay the blame of this on the black citizens. They called this a Negro uprising. In other words, if they had just stayed where they were, if they hadn't come out of Greenwood, none of this would have happened. They brought this on themselves to almost kind of justify what they did. Um, but the, because of being labeled a riot, they could not, all of their insurance claims were denied. So the fact that they have even stayed and rebuilt Greenwood is phenomenal. Again, the resilience, that human spirit of resistance and resilience. And so they rebuilt. By 1926, five years later, 80 to 90 percent of Greenwood was rebuilt. An incredible feat, even on today's standards. The apex of all the economic activity of Greenwood actually was not achieved until after the destruction. Um, it was built back bigger and almost twice the size in terms of its economic viability than it was prior to the destruction. By 1943, there were over 1,200 black owned homes, over 200 black owned businesses, over seven grocery stores, over three hospitals, and the list goes on and on. And that was in the 1940s. Again, this is the side of the story that people just don't know. People think time stood still in 1921. Very few outside of Oklahoma even realized the community rebuilt itself. So then what happened? We talk about the second decline. We talk about the building of the I-244 program, the urban re renewal program that many black citizens around the country call urban removal of the 60s and 70s, because these highway, federal highway programs always found themselves going through the communities of color. Chicago, uh, Detroit, Columbus, Ohio, Houston, you can go around the country and even here in Tulsa and Greenwood, they were always built through the black communities, the communities of color. Imagine all the, the black homes and businesses that were uprooted because of eminent domain, because of building these highway systems. This was the death nail to Greenwood and went right through the heart of the community. Secondly was the impact of integration and what that did to the economic economy of black communities. And then the fact that in the 70s and 80s, as black citizens and their children left to go to college and to be successful and left Oklahoma never to return, many of these mom and pop shops did not have anyone to pass their businesses down to. So as they died, their businesses died with them. And so all of this, these, this, these exhibits lead to the final chamber, a chamber called the Journey to Reconciliation. And that is an amphitheater space style room a classroom style room, a space where black citizens, white citizens, young, old, people of color, people from different places and uh, communities can sit and have some discussions. Let's have this difficult discussion once and for all about race. How do we go from here? How do we change the next 100 years? How do we get past where we are in the divisiveness of our country if we don't sit down and just have some real conversations and a safe space to have those conversations. If Greenwood Rising was alive and well today, the number of community programs that we would have hosted to talk about how do we deal with the shooting of an Ahmad Arbery, a black man just jogging through his neighborhood, accused of being a robber, and before you know it, he he's murdered. There are different sides of that equation. Citizens who believe that the authorities acted in their right citizens who believe that um, over activity of the neighborhood um, and their bias against black citizens cause a man's life to be taken. Let's talk about these very real issues. The number of this programs would have had to talk about the aftermath of a George Floyd and communities of color and the challenges between um, uh, the relationship between the police and communities of color. How do we talk about these very real issues? 
Um, how do we talk about a community like Tulsa, where some citizens are still trying to heal from what they feel is justice not being served from Terrence Crutcher and his shooting, a black man with his hands up. There are many narratives of that. There's many sides of that equation that we need to hear from and hear and have a space to talk through that. Until we can see each other's point of view through the other person's perspective, we will never get to understand that we've got to change people's hearts and minds. And that's what Greenwood Rising is going to do. And so that is pretty much an overview of Greenwood Rising. We're also building a, a walking path called Pathway to Hope that will be a beautiful landscape with trees and sitting benches and black art and pioneers of Greenwood that you'll be able to view and watch and walk all the way from Greenwood over to Elgin. And this is seen as a symbol of rejoining the Greenwood district that was destroyed by the building of the I-244 program, uh, the Pathway to Hope. We also are planning some significant events for the week of the centennial, as you see there from May 31st all the way to June the 6th, and even the annual Juneteenth Festival that takes place in June 19th. A host of different programs from the nationally televised program that will take place on March 31st, the actual 100th anniversary right here in Greenwood at the Driller Stadium, um, a candlelight vigil that night uh, at 1030 that marks the first shots that were fired 100 years ago, um, Economic Empowerment Day, uh, the dedication of the museum, Greenwood Rising on that Wednesday, a National Day of Learning, a Greenwood Film Festival, a Dreamland Again event, a combination between the Tulsa Symphony Orchestra um, and a community chorus and a collaboration where classical meets gospel, jazz, and hip hop all in an evening concert. And then the Black Wall Street Memorial Run. All of these events are planned to be safe, socially distant, and planned to be one in which thousands upon thousands of people are already booking hotel rooms and making their way here to be here during that time for the centennial. For any more information, to continue uh, keeping abreast of all that we're doing, visit Tulsa2021.org, sign up for a newsletter, sign up to be a volunteer. We're gonna need many volunteers to be trained, to be docents, to lead people through Greenwood Rising History Center. Um, you can also make a donation. We're still, uh, we're in the final leg of a $30 million campaign. We've raised almost $28 million in the last year and a half, which is a phenomenal feat. And we're taking donations from anyone that can give $50, $100, or a million dollars, whatever it be. And we're gonna have those people's names on a larger than life wall that will be showcased inside Greenwood Rising uh, to showcase that the community, regardless of their resources, came together and contributed so that we could build Greenwood Rising. You can sign up for that and donate there, but keep abreast of all that we're going and all that we're doing leading up to 2021 and beyond at Tulsa2021.org. I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this time, and, and um, I hope that uh, you all have uh, got a few wrinkles in your brain, but hope you understand how significant and how impactful uh, this is going to be for the city of Tulsa, uh, for the state of Oklahoma. Imagine Oklahoma becoming a place where people can come to experience racial healing, um, to begin a bond of racial reconciliation and harmony, using this tragedy as a backdrop that can actually end up being going from tragedy to triumph, bringing people together so that again, we can move forward the next hundred years in a totally different way than where we've been so far. And you'd have to be living under a rock the last six months to a year uh, to not see what we're doing with Greenwood Rising and not say Greenwood Rising is needed now in our country more than ever. So with that, I will turn it over to any uh, questions or any comments that may have come in that uh, maybe uh, Chloe or someone wants to let me know and, and let's have a little discussion for the time that we have left. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, much for that talk. talk. I would, I would just do, do I'm, I'm echo, echo now. Um, um, I would like, I would to, like to say, and, and the first question, question is from is Jenny, Jenny Green. Green. And, and the question is, is was, was this newspaper or journalist ever held accountable for their 
Chloe, we're having some some significant problems hearing you. Your your audio is going in and out, um, so I wasn't able to to really okay. hear this question. Can you hear me better now? I can. Okay, wonderful. Was the newspaper or journalist ever held accountable for the articles that were written? And that specific one you mentioned, but any of the other things that were really incendiary, was anybody ever held responsible for that? And were any did any were any charges ever pressed with this? It's an excellent question. Um, that is really what is still painful to many descendants and survivor descendants of the survivors is that to this day, a uh, hundred years later, no one, not one person was ever brought to justice. No one was ever had to pay a fine. Um, no one uh, was held accountable. The Tulsa Tribune in the months after, because they got so much national attention, they realized what could possibly happen in that they could be held liable. Um, the city leaders had the Tulsa Tribune destroy their um, articles, destroy their papers, their, their records, um, only by only because we have people who have saved newspaper articles that, that were sent in to the Oklahoma Historical Society uh, back in 1997, do we have just images. The microfiche was all destroyed. So um, again, all we have are the newspaper articles that can verify. If we imagine if we didn't have those, there would be those that would say we're just lying with it. Uh, you're making this up. Um, that this really didn't happen this way. It's only because citizens held on to their newspapers because they destroyed the evidence. They destroyed pictures. And that's why there's not as as many pictures as we have uh, from the Tulsa Historical Society in Oklahoma. So we should have thousands more, but we don't because there was a concerted effort to destroy and to cover it up. Um, we actually there were actually white owners, believe it or not, that had businesses in Greenwood. It was a very interactive com community, even though you had segregation and Jim Crow and black citizens could not exercise their dollar outside of Greenwood. Um, white citizens would come into Greenwood and go to the stores, buy buy things because of the high quality in nature. They would definitely come to the speakeasies and to the to the programs and the music events and the bars and hang out. But there was a white gentleman. We actually have a record in the historical society, a white gentleman that came to the Tulsa court system at that time and said, I know and can name some of the white citizens that perpetrated this act. I saw them. I will give my witness account. I will put my affidavit in and I will let you know who they were. The case was dismissed. The court would not hear his case as a white man, and they definitely would not hear the, the pleas from the black community. It was completely covered up so that no one would be brought to justice. And I know that's hard to believe, but even today, no one has paid one dollar to anything that happened to these victims, to the destruction. Uh, even here we are in 2021 and not one dollar, not one person has been brought to justice for what happened. Well, thank you so much for um, in, in many ways kind of bringing to light these stories. It's not justice per se, but at least we're getting some kind of, I think, awareness more about the situation. There's a question from Regina saying there's a monument in Black History Museum in this area. Is the new museum being built in the same area? I'm, I'm guessing she means in Tulsa, but I, you can answer that probably a little better. Yes, Greenwood Rising is being built, built right at the corner of Greenwood and Archer. Um, there are two specific icons that are already here. Um, and we are within walking distance. This is all historic Greenwood. If you ever come here, you will be able to walk from the Greenwood Cultural Center that was built in 1995, and it has the 1921 race right memorial that stands out front and being refurbished this year. It is a listing of all the businesses that were destroyed and the, 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 the claim, the insurance filings that they filed that they never were paid out all on a memorial. It's a memorial to the businesses that were destroyed in the economic. Then there is the John Holt Franklin Park. Again, you just walk across a parking lot and you'll be able to see uh, there. That was that's been there since 19. I'm sorry for the last 10 years. It is the actual tribute to the lives that were lost. There is a beautiful um, just moving statue in the middle of that uh, park and it is a tribute to the, the lives that were lost. And so there was never a place built 
to actually showcase the full expanse of history. And that's where Green and Rising finds its place. Um, and again, these are all within walking distance of each other. So this is really going to become, um, if it's not already, it's going to become an historic uh, cultural tourism area where people can go from these icons and see history and see the tributes to this community. That is so wonderful. I know we're all, many of us in here, are looking forward to visiting Tulsa at some point. It's not too far away from us here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, when can we um, expect the your museum to open? It will open as we're going to have a debut and a dedication ceremony during the week of the centennial. It's right now it's planned for Wednesday, June the 2nd, where we'll dedicate the building. Um, it will not be fully open to the public till sometime later in the summer. But we're going to uh, intentionally have private viewings. Uh, first, it will be to the uh, families of the descendants of the Black Wall Street legacy and, and North Tulsa residents who will have uh, their first opportunity to go through the museum and, and experience it. And uh, you can imagine it will probably be a very um, emotionally striking time for, for many. So we want to give them that plenty of time to have that respect. And then we'll have opportunities for the media to come through and, and elected officials and donors for VIP guests. Um, so we expect this to be dedicated during the centennial and then fully open to the public to come through um, probably the latter part of June of 2021. Wonderful. Great news. I'm, sh I'm sure many of us are looking at our calendars right now and wondering when we can make it up to Tulsa. The next question is saying is, does having a fictional portrayal like the one you showed at the beginning make it easier or harder to get the true story out? Best way I can describe that, um, and it's an excellent question, by the way, it's like um, playing pickup basketball in the back gym on a Saturday afternoon at the YMCA and you get to bring um, Michael Jordan along with you as your buddy and he's going to play on your team. Um, what that does to your team for that day of basketball and what it does for you and your teammates is what HBO Watchmen did for the Centennial Commission. It elevated. We've been doing this work since 2015 and we had small pockets of people who knew and we were trying to get it out. What that did is bring to the world's view what took place here and then called, cause an immediate reaction from millennials to older citizens, uh, from news agencies. It put it on the forefront that this really happened. You got to be kidding me. And I need to know more about this. And it, it really brought attention to Greenwood and, and Tulsa and the work of the commission. Um, it was the greatest gift. And we and, and obviously we've become very close with the HBO production team. Damon Lindelof is the executive producer of that. Um, uh, he and I uh, converse and, and he is a wonderful, wonderful human being and, and get to talk with him. Um, uh, and also one of the main actors in, in Watchmen is Tim Blake Nelson. Um, you might remember him from uh, the role he played in Oh Brother, Where Out Thou? But he is a Tulsa native. His his mother, uh, Ruth Kaiser Nelson, and his and, and his family. Uh, he's from Tulsa, so that was part of the connection too. I believe he had a lot to do with Damon Lindelof and the team coming to Tulsa and learning the history before they wrote uh, that into their script. Um, so yes, it was a a big boost to have HBO Watchmen do that. Kind of makes you wonder how many people googled when watching that just seeing is this actually even a true event right and then being rather shocked to to find that out it was uh to your point it was the most googled search august the 21st 22nd 23rd uh i think on google they reported the most searched and watched and requested item was the the that, that sequence People just wanted to go and see it again. Have you seen this? And people were sending it, sending the link, and then researching Greenwood. Did this happen? Your race riot, 1921. It was the most searched thing around the world for about uh, a couple of weeks straight. That is incredible. As a historian, I always enjoy when, you know, pop culture and history kind of come together and things that we truly care about and want other people to know about become something that many others do as well. And um, the next question from Chalmers says, how many Tulsa incidents occur around America 
and throughout history that we might not have the opportunity to hear about. We're really blessed with um, with some sources that remain from this, but how many others do we think are really out there that maybe have not had the chance to be, you know, fleshed out in this kind of way? Excellent question. And since this is a, a college, I'm going to give all of you some homework. Uh, including you, Chloe. I'm getting everybody some homework. No one's exempt. I want you all to write this down. Red summer of 1919. I'm going to repeat it. Red summer, like spring, summer, fall, winter. Red summer of 1919. Don't do it now, <laughs> but when we get off this call, I want you all to go and put that into Wikipedia search or to Google search. You, what you will find is that in the summer of 1919, a six month period, the level of racial animosity in this country was at a, a height. Historians say that in 1919, America went through, uh, uh, it was a, the nadir, um, the nadir, it's a, it's a historical reference term, the nadir of race, race relations in the United States was in 1919. That means extreme low point. In a six month period of time, over 15 communities of color, segregated communities, were ramp rampaged, destroyed, burned out, killed, murdered, all in, again, a six month period of time. It's called red because of the blood that was spilled. Uh, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Houston, um, uh, Elaine, Arkansas is one of the most famous ones. Uh, again, in a six month period in Elaine, Arkansas, over a thousand African Americans, Elaine, Arkansas was a black community like Greenwood, over a thousand were murdered in a day. Um, and what happened? Well, soldiers were returning from the war in 1919, War One. White soldiers were returning to a very um, horrible economy um, in the United States. White citizens were not able to get jobs, people were being laid off. Um, and But yet, because of these segregated insular economies, the black dollar, because they supported one another, the black dollar re recycled itself among these communities over and over. And so the animosity was, here I am struggling. I'm a white person trying to pay my bills, trying to, about to be homeless. And across the tracks or on the other side of town are black citizens who are driving nice cars, wearing nice coats, got businesses, and I'm sick and tired of it. They think they're better than us. And so in a six month period of time, the summer of 1919, over 15 incidents where communities just went in and destroyed communities. Uh, years ago in the mid 90s, there was a movie called Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored about Rosewood, Florida. That is a depiction of what happened in 1919. Um, that movie was a book that was written by Clifton Talbert. Clifton Talbert is a Tulsa native, grew up in North Tulsa, and he wrote that book that turned into a movie. Um, but again, I want you all to take time to go research that because this did not just happen to Greenwood. It happened many times over the course of time in many communities, but more specifically during the summer of 1919. Thank you for that. And hopefully if you are enrolled in a U.S. History 2 class, you are about to learn that in the next few weeks as we are moving throughout the second half of U.S. History. And if not, maybe, you know, Definitely also look it up, but you should also, I hope, please be learning that as well. Um, do you think that we will ever have another Black Wall Street for African Americans in the United States? It's an excellent question. The ma I keep on repeating this, so but I want to but I want to put it in the context. The reason a Black Wall Street and these Black communities could prosper so well is ironically because of Jim Crow. If it wasn't for segregated laws, there would they basically black communities were forced to stay within their own confines. Now that sounds very harsh, but some today look back and kind of think, man, I wish we had some aspect of that, not Jim Crow and segregation, but that today what you'll hear is support black owned businesses. But imagine when it wasn't a phrase, it was all you could do. The only place you could go and buy your groceries, the only place you could go and buy a car or buy clothes or just have any type of economy where you're, you know, exchanging goods for services and, and, and for money 
was among your own community and people that look like you. So that's why these communities prospered. Will there ever be a black Wall Street? Not, no, not to that level, not to that extent. There will be opportunities and there are opportunities now where revitalization efforts are happening so that there can be greater access to capital for communities of color, for black owned homes and black owned businesses and black communities that are historic, that are finding a resurgence. But there's just no way that you'll get to that level. There were multimillionaires because of land ownership and because of oil and gas discovery um, in Oklahoma, black citizens who owned land, they received those royalty checks from those oil companies, literally white citizens who own land and black citizens became multimillionaires overnight. That's what made Greenwood so and, and Oklahoma so powerful economically because of the oil and gas discovery. There would have to be a tsunami of economic uh, overflow from some industry that would happen in the same way that would impact one specific area like it did Oklahoma. That's what why this was dubbed Black Wall Street. Um, but we teach more so now. Black Wall Street is not necessarily anymore a geographic location. Black Wall Street is a state of mind. You can have Black Wall Street wherever you are. Um, and that's what the inspiration of this is for communities of color and youth and young people growing up now is that it's not nothing new to have um, black people that are in high positions of authority and companies and making money. This has been around for a long time. It's just we haven't educated and shown and the number of children, the number of students that uh, through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, if they'd have known and would have been taught on a wide scale the things that you could achieve with your mind and with your creativity and with your own hands, that's what's happening now. So that spirit of Black Wall Street is happening now all over the country in communities where I can, I really can do this. I really can. And it's not just an uh, an anomaly, you know, a Robert Johnson, a Black African-American who, who paid off all of the college debt of the graduating class of Howard University in, in 2019. That's not an that's not an anomaly. You know, there have been multimillionaire black citizens throughout our country's history. It's just no one's ever taken the time to put something together to educate and show this. So I would say Black Wall Street, the spirit of Black Wall Street is live and well, and I will see the spirit of Black Wall Street just continue to flourish uh, so that when you go to uh, LA and you wanna go to Chinatown and experience that culture, or if you go to um, um, different pockets of communities and Latin communities uh, in, in Miami, when you come to Greenwood, we want people to see, to experience the Black culture, the Black experience of, of entrepreneurialism, of Black excellence. And uh, we see that happening here and the, the signs that there will be a huge resurgence of that and an area that will, that of Greenwood that will shine again over the next three, five to 10 years. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. So there's been a lot of pushback on the 1619 project. What do you think about that? And have you experienced any of that kind of pushback with your own work that you're doing? Yes, yeah, so the pushback on that, um, it comes from people who do not take the time to really evaluate all of history. Um, there is a segment of our country that feel that if you talk about the negative things of our country, that you are bashing the United States, that you are not being patriotic. What I am trying to, to impose to people is that you can't have true healing until you tell the truth. Um, there, when, when, when people were singing and writing the songs, my country tips of the sweet land of liberty, you have to tell the truth. There was a segment of our society that was not experiencing that liberty. Um, the, the value that happens when you say we're not uh, saying that we're no longer going to celebrate the 4th of July and our country's independence. Of course we celebrate that. Of course we push forward. But we also say, but guess what? There's also a portion of history um, that black citizens celebrate their freedom. You know, June 19th, 1865, called Juneteenth, where black citizens were finally free and set free and emancipated, and they celebrate their own set of freedom within this country. That's not a negative thing. 
that is a celebration that within this great democracy of ours, we've got some good things, we've got some bad things, and yes, we sure enough have some ugly things, but until you are able to address them all and say, hey, this is a part of our history, we've got to get rid of this notion that because I want to share the realness of history, sometimes the rawness of history, that that means that I'm trying to take away from all that is this great place called America. And we just need to get to a place where people can understand that. The 1619 Project is simply to acknowledge that, hey, before 1776, the people who were brought here um, and landed in Virginia brought with them the first um, portions or parts of slavery. And that is a history that began before we celebrate independence in 1776. It's a project to say, let's tell the full story. Lay, um, um, and I'll finish with this quote, the inspiration for what I'm coming from and what I'm trying to get people to understand and those who try to push back um, is the um, African-American playwright, James Baldwin said this, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. America, we got to face that these things are a part of our history, 1776 and 1619. And when we face them together and then say, you know what, this needs to be included in history books, the good, the bad and the ugly then you really can get on a path of reconciliation, of healing, because you're not shutting out portion of the history, you're bringing it all into perspective. And I don't know about you, but it helps me understand why my patriotism and my love for this country means so much more because of what some people and some demographics have had to go through to be here and live here and call this United States of America. It just makes it that much more rich and enriching when people say freedom is not free, I can say, yeah, you're right. And I can tell you some of the costs that people have paid for that freedom. Thank you so much. And our last question today, and this is something I think you're you're addressing every day in your work. And it says, how do we account for such major events falling out of our collective consciousness in our history? How do we make sure that these events are included in our national history? You create curriculum and you would create um, opportunities for states and cities to have it a part of their required teaching. For example, here in Oklahoma, we're working on the initiative to make this curriculum and this um, a major part of Oklahoma history. You, before you get a diploma from high school in, Oklahoma, uh, in Oklahoma, you have to have a certain amount of credits in Oklahoma history. What we are proposing is that a portion of that Oklahoma history is the history of Greenwood and then all black towns of Oklahoma and the 1921 Tulsa race massacre that you have when you check off that box and you've been tested on it and you get your high school degree. We know that we will no longer have generations of children growing up, going to college to finally hear this. That can be a nationwide standard on some of these things that you don't have to be a part of a certain society or a group or community, but some things are a part of our history and it is taught so people can see how rich and vibrant um, communities were all over the country. We've just never been told about them before. I really enjoy that idea about including it younger because I do think that sometimes at, in college, we do, we are confronted with so many new things at once. And I often have students asking, why did I never learn about this before? And I really love that idea about pursuing this at an earlier age and also just attending these museums, going and getting to learn more about your project, I think is a way that we can all do that and educate the young ones in our lives as well. And sometimes the older ones in our lives need some, need some of this as well, right? So thank you so much, Phil. If you want to put the website down, we can put that in the Q&A really quickly as well for anybody to come and visit your website and to be able to learn how they can contribute, how they can come and visit when it's open, how they can financially donate if that is something that you're able to do and just kind of get involved. And we can't wait to see what comes next from the this whole Tulsa project. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you again for having me. Yes, it's Tulsa2021.org. 
Tulsa2021.org. And to give everybody a perspective, uh, um, and I'm so thankful we do have a vaccine and vaccinations are taking place, but I can tell you last fall, people started booking our hotel rooms. Uh, we are, we're working in conjunction with the Tulsa Visitors Bureau. We have a contract and a, and, a, and, a, and a booking code to give people discounts and to know what the economic impact to our city is during the week of May 26th to June the 6th on this history. Um, we started out with, with contracting with four hotels. And again, this is in the midst of the pandemic, long before the vaccine. Um, by December, we had to open that number up to seven. We're now at eight, and we're probably going to end up going to about 10 to 12 hotels. There are, as of two weeks ago, there are already 712 rooms that have been booked for this time period, and that's before we get to the rush of March and April. So we are preparing, COVID or not, here they come. So uh, all of our events, we're having to keep um, in mind the investment in PPP uh, materials and masks and sanitizing stations and being prepared for the fact that thousands of people are making a pilgrimage here. We hope that you are one of them. And But I guess I said all that to say, if you're going to come here, you better book your room now uh, because uh, there, there won't be a hotel to find within miles of downtown Tulsa if you wait too late. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. TCC is so happy that you took time out of your day to come and join us and help us learn more about this event and about your project. Have a great day, everyone, and we will see you at our next event. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.